Camera's live in three, two, one. Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Kato. Welcome and good evening in the Northern Hemisphere. And Kiora in Aotearoa, Morena, good morning. It's lovely to be here. It's lovely to be here with Natalie, Alex, and Graham. Over to you, Natalie, Alex, and Graham. You have to un unmute with classically. It's brilliant. Good. <laughs> Again with it unmuted and then thought, oh, better mute it. Kia ora. Kia ora koutou katoa. We're going to begin with a karakia to centre us today. And so that's to bring us all together. It's a very brief, uh, well-known karakia. And uh, we'll be saying that now. And then we're going to hand back to Paula. So kia ora. Whakataka te hau ki te uru. Whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kinikina ki uta, kia mā tarotara ki tai. E hi a kiana te atakura, te tio, te huka, te hauhu, te hei maori ora. Cease the winds from the west, cease the winds from the south. Let the breeze blow over the land, let the breeze blow over the ocean. Let the red-tipped dawn come with a sharpened air, a touch of frost. A promise of a glorious day. For us in Aotearoa, it's the beginning of our day. And so that's a karakia of prayer to center us and bring us to the start of this uh, webinar that we're really excited to join you with today. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you, Natalie. It really is an honor to be here um, this evening. And when Alice Sharp, the director, of Invisible Dust asked me last week um, if I'd join these three, two brilliant artists and amazing Graham to kind of really, you know, talk about um, their film together in this discussion and asked me to kind of host this conversation around the 16 minute film, um, which is titled Taranga. I'm gonna, it's going to die. This is the one that I've just, the test, just, this is the test. Taranga. Oh, Alex, you're going to have to pronounce it. Sorry. I'm this, I've done all the, I've done all the rest. I'm doing well. This is a really good start, guys. <laughs> uh, you've done, you, you did really well in the backstage practice. It's just always live. That's, it's really tricky. Te reringa pauri, i para whenua mea. So the, the film is The Desolate Journey of Sediment, um, which is about this, the Pacific Ocean and the indigenous conservation of the biodiversity in the Tarawiti region. So this event includes a screening of the film and an in conversation with Graham Atkins, Nati Poro, uh, Kiti Aki of uh, the Rakamari Range, and Alex Monteith, artist Alex Monteith, and Natalie Robertson, um, Nata Paul Rowe. The, um, the themes around living nature that Invisible Dust and the partners have devised is about creating a kind of hybrid program exploring the future of human relationships with nature through a lens of art, science, and indigenous wisdom. So living, nature is generally positioned as a positive forward looking and they hope um, to inspire audiences with, hum with how human nature relationships can be positive, reciprocal and resilient. The themes that the program is addressing are really kind of centered around indigenous wisdom. How can we reimagine our relationship with nature and humanity's future and its role through an understanding of indigenous knowledge. Our human nature relationship, what can humans learn from the rest of life and how will our relationships with nature shape our future? 
So responding also to the climate crisis, how we, we respond carefully and urgently. And as you will all know, and hearing about in the news, the forthcoming COP26, which is the most urgent call to action we can ever, ever, ever hope for on this planet and our future. So introducing our speakers and our panel this evening, Graham Atkins is a conservation ranger for the Department of Conservation, and he's devoted his whole life to protecting and restoring the native flora in the Tarawiti region. In 2020, he was awarded New Zealand's most prestigious conservation award, the Loder Cup. The cup was first donated in 1926 to encourage and honor New Zealanders who work to investi investigate, promote, retain, and cherish indigenous flora. Graham, ad Graham's advocacy restoring the health of the forests has helped secure a record 34 million investment in the Rokamara, um, sorry, Rokamara project. And he's also advocated for restoring the conservation park, which has been devastated by introduced, uh, introduced pests. I know the artists Alex Monteith and Natalie Robertson from an exhibition, Precarious Nature, that we were able to collaborate and work together in New Zealand in, back in 2017. Natalie Robertson, Nati Poro, is a Natura Aotearoa New Zealand photographer, video artist, and lecturer at Auckland University of Technology, whose work has been exhibited around the world. Much of Natalie's practice is based on Tata, Tata Rawiti, her East Coast Naporo homelands. Her focus is on the ancestral Waipu River and her protracted. Um, catastrophic impacts of the colonization on the ancestral defor sorry on the ancestral land and the deforestation and the intensive agriculture as a tribal member robertson sees it's her responsibility to protect the life force of the river she uses photography and video to record the state of the river surrounding the land and to commun communicate tribal narratives Drawing on historic archives and tribal oral customs, her research terrain and artistic practice engages with indigenous relationships to land and place, exploring Maori knowledge practices, environmental issues and cultural landscapes. Alex Monteith is a new media artist born in Belfast, Northern Ireland in 1977, now lives and works in Auckland after moving to New Zealand in 1987. Alex's work focuses on political issues surrounding land ownership, history and occupation. Her work traverses political movements, contemporary sports, culture and social activities. Many of her projects are located in large or extreme geographies, such as the ocean. She has staged solo exhibitions at the Gavette Brewster Art Gallery and the Museum for Modern Kunst in Frankfurt, Germany. So thank you ever so much for being here. Tenakoto and I hang, hand over to the three of you. So Graham, we'll ask you to start first with us, thank you. Oh, kia ora, um, ko hikurangi te maunga, ko waiapu te awa, ko raukumura te ngahere, ko ngāti parau te iwi, ko Graham Atkins taku ingoa. Yeah, I'd just like to um, thank the organisers for the opportunity to um, spread the message. So. Um, yeah, it's a topical issue at the moment, especially with um, what's happening, going to be happening in the next week or so in Glasgow. And so a lot of people seem to think that um, big world problems are, are exactly that, but, um, I, you know, our, our impact across the planet is um, widespread now. And so, yeah, it's um, pretty cool to um, um, link up or network with um, other indigenous researchers. And so, yeah. Looking forward to it. Kia ora. Kia ora e te whanganga. Ko hiki rangi tuku maunga, ko waipu tuku awa, ko ngāti parau tuku iwi, ko te whanau pōkai, tuku hapu, ko Natalie Robertson taku ingoa. Uh, hiki rangi is my mountain, waipu is my river, 
Nash Pro is my iwi Tano Pukai is my uh, sub tribe, and oh, Nash Pro is our uh, wider tribal polity, and Tano Pukai are our uh, more intimate Tano family uh, scale grouping. And I'm also of settler colonial descent, take Clan Donakai of Scotland as my overarching um, tribe there, or clan that connects me to those parts of the world where many of my ancestors came from in the settler colonial era. Uh, I also want to thank our organisers and our connections over many years with Alice Sharp and with uh, others who have brought us here together and to Paula, our host here, who invited us into Precarious Nature some years ago. Kia ora, Alex, I'll pass it over to you. Uh, ko Blue Stack Te Maunga, ko Dirg Te Awa, ko Atlantic Te Moana, no Irani Aho, ko Ngātapakia Te Iwi, ko Carol Monte Te Toka Whaia, ko Bill Monte Te Toka Papa, ko Tuatapa Te Moana Taka Tamahini, ko Vaimana Te Piha Taka Tamahini, ki Te Piha Toka Kainga Nainei, ko Alex Monte Te Toka Ingoa, tēnā koutou. Uh, it is a really special honour for me to be um, beaming in there today because, um, the, as I said in the pipiha, um, I'm from Ireland, Northern Ireland, the north of Ireland, and um, I'm living now at Piha on the west coast uh, of, um, so the west coast, Tamaki Makoto is the city, um, but it's two west coasts that I kind of connect with, two oceans, and my parents are actually in the audience today, so kia ora. Lovely. I believe that we're going to go straight into the film now um, and the link will be distributed, I think, in the chat or has been already for everyone to watch the film. And then we'll come back around 10 minutes past nine, I understand. Or it's only quarter to nine now, so we probably just need 20 minutes, so maybe five past might be. OK. We've been faster than we expected this day. Yeah, we've been more efficient. Okay, that's great. We'll have more time to chat. So let's come back at five minutes past nine, everyone, and enjoy the film. I certainly can't wait to watch it. Kia ora. I thought if it's okay to introduce um, for the audience um, with you, with all three of you to kind of give a bit of context to how you came to work together on this film. Um, Graham, I understand that the vision for the film comes from, I suppose, your experience of that land and seeing the erosion of the gullies over you know, years of experience. And you had this idea of kind of looking at the land from, from, from the sky, from, from the air. I think it'd be really, really useful to kind of understand from your, your experience, but also from um, Natalie and Alex and how you, how you came together to kind of work on this film. Yeah, kia ora. So, um... I'm a born and bred local here, so um, um, half a century of roaming around this land and um, a, a lot of what we showed on the video is not really visible to the, the people that live here other than watching our, our riverbed rise because of the, the increasing sediment loads. And so um, through, through my, through my um, whakapapa ties, my um, genealogy collection, connections with Natalie and her, her connections with um, um, Alex. Um, I put the seed in their head about, you know, um, trying to get this the, the community that live here to understand, um, you know, our most pressing environmental issue. And um, it was all new to me, the, um, the arts and... Um, conservation collaboration, but um, I've seen some of um, 
Natalie's and um, Alex's previous work and um, the wider audience engagement. And so, yeah, I was, you know, really, really um, um, looking forward to the, the possibilities of um, um, sharing those messages with the communities that live right here. So, mm. and yeah, that's pretty much where it started. Sure, I'll just uh, can pick up on that. My grandfather, David Hughes, uh, um, gifted me the trust, one of the roles of the trustee for our land at just along at Port Awanui or Maiwa, just south of the Waiaku River mouth. And when I first began uh, staying on the Whenua during the summer, uh, we met Graham, got to know Graham and his family, and it's a paradise for us. It's a really, it's a, it's our, it's our physical and spiritual homeland. So to see this, these plumes of sediment coming out of the Waipu River mouth, it took me a long time to understand that that was a, a far greater environmental problem than the gorse, the blackberry, the Japanese honeysuckle, all of these introduced plants that were smothering the land. That felt a big enough problem. And I would talk to Graham about how to work with that problem. And you know these these issues of introduced uh, species, but this plume of sediment kept coming, and it was you know we'd go for a swim and you'd be in amongst sediment and uh, pieces of wood and all sorts in a place that there's no other people on the beach. So for seven kilometres, then there's only us to have all of this rubbish in a way coming from upstream and changing an environment that feels so isolated from the problems of dense urban space. Mm. It, I was just like, where's this coming from? Mm. And so that question of where is this coming from? Why is it coming from places that are actually still cloaked in, uh, where there are still some hillsides cloaked in, in bush? And so Graham really opened our eyes to the multiple layers of problems there of, uh, the introduced species, the deforestation, the government policies that affected all of the land. And so it's one of those things, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Mm -hmm. And when we began to hear about, really understand what was happening with the geomorphology with these massive slips, and when Graham said that there's an, you know, another thousand ticking time bombs out there, we were like, well, we've got to do something. And Alex and I have got a, we've worked together at AUT, but we've also continued, we've just have a really natural collaboration and strong friendship as well. And I think at the heart of all of this too is our love for each other and love for Fenua and what can we do to assist Graham, seeing how much he's shouldering responsibility for what's happening with Rotumara. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Alex, would you like to add anything? Oh, just to acknowledge um, that, I guess, um, joining this conversation came through initially quite informal means, as Graham said, like we would we would be on the coast together um, in terms of, you know, uh, just being together on Natalie's whānau land and then next door Graham's whānau land and hearing stories that related to upstream and then also um, at one point um, I went hunting with Graham and his daughter and so that was actually my first encounter with what became known uh, as the Blue Slip. And I met uh, back, it sort of must be nearly 20 years ago now, around 2008, we were coming down the hill on the quad bike and Graham just sort of said, look at that over there, Craters of the Moon. And mm. at that time, it actually stuck in my head for many, many years mm. and trying to contend with what, um, what that was. And actually at the time, Graham mentioned that you could see that slip from outer space. So um, the, the scale of it, and then as, as you're traveling around the lowlands, you can see on the lower parts, even of uh, Natalie's Farno land, there are slips there, but it's only when you start to sort of begin to try and put together the scale of what's happening upstream with the signs downstream, the relations, the related slips, that it, it's sort of a thing to do with scale that becomes quite difficult to kind of contend with and to kind of conceptualize. So over time, I think we all settled into a space of trying to work together um, on the question of storytelling. And it, it has actually been something like a 20 year journey to arrive at this point together. And um, also maybe I'll just say I'm a surfer. So I've, I've actually um, been in water contact more so with sediment in that way 
so I've just sort of when you when you sit there you're, you're watching it moving around and so when people are talking about sediment I ha had a kind of an understanding of certain experiences of that but try, trying to understand it more so is the oil slick that Graham was talking about um, when you've been steeped in seeing highly sedimented rivers all of my adult life and as a child of um, farming or a grandchild of a farming family um, the state of the rivers had gone a long way into declination and um, with high sediment high nitrate and so we're we're coming into a conversation with a lot of um, need for un unlearning and unseeing and um, battling trying to battle back um, you know yeah in, in, in terms of the waterways so yeah kia ora. the um I think the most striking experience that I remember standing kind of between the sort of Southern Alps and the, on the South Coast and looking back to the West Coast um, on, on the South Island and then across to kind of Christchurch and seeing the intensive kind of farming and, um, you know, really kind of sanitised landscape heading towards from um, the bush through to Christchurch and for me often when we were thinking about exhibitions at, at Coco and um, Toy Maroki was really kind of thinking about the relationship that that centre the gallery has with the place but also the shifting kind of um, the shifting experience of New Zealand as well and I think leading on to kind of um, the suggestions that you guys have kind of um, brought together. I think it's really important now, Graham, to kind of understand what has happened since the film and to understand, you know, is the, obviously is the, you know, the erosion continuing? Yes, yeah, so unfortunately for um, features like the Blue Slip, they're um, beyond remediation, much as it hurts to say that, but um, as um, Alex um, or um, Matt mentioned earlier about in, in that catchment, there's a thousand other gullies that are with each passing storm. And then, you know, with climate change, we seem to be having a lot more intense um, downfalls. Um, a, lot of those, a lot of those eroding gullies have got the potential to become, you know, like the blue slip, like Barton Scully, and um, um, since we've made, you know, since we brought the the erosion issue out into the the public arena, especially back here, it's a it's a lot topical issue. And then um, we've got a project that's um, been going for for about a year, a year and a half now, and um, a big a big um, focus of its um, purpose is. Um, restoration of the uh, the lower parts of the um, the lower parts of the catchment where, where I live and so many of the side streams and, and rivers that flow into the into the Waipu and so what that project does is it, is it um, they build debris dams to try and keep the sediment in the upper parts of these side rivers um, they planted poles um, willow and poplar poles to um, um, put vegetation back along, um, you know, denuded watercourses, so riparian plantings, and they've they fenced off a lot of um, waterways, and um, they're planting up thousands and thousands of native native plants um, um, along along many of these side rivers. So, um, yeah, it's a, this, this, this is a situation that's come about through you know, 120 or 150 years of, um, uh, I've got to choose my words correctly here, um, of um, the wrong land land use. And so mm -hmm. many of the, many of the, of the, of the, the land blocks that were cleared were way too steep and should never have been cleared um, in the past. Um, and, you know, we've got such a fragile geology and in the past, when it was all under heavy bush, um, we we never had the erosion issues that we have now. And so, yeah, um, I'm optimistic that um, you know things are changing. And um, we've since since we've made the film, they've had um, we've had an agree uh, agreement with 
our local runanga, that's our iwi sort of tribal council, um, the, our local regional council or district council, the Gisborne District Council, MPI, that's the central government agency that's charged with um, um, landscape rehabilitation, probably a good, you know, good way to, to um, say it. And um, it's got a, we, we, all those all those agencies signed a joint management agreement at, at our home marae, um, and that 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 was to a hundred year um, restoration plan for for the Waipu catchment. So it's um it's pretty complex because not a, a lot of the a lot of the the land that's inside the catchment is in private ownership and and multiple ownership as well, and uh, there's. A myriad of stakeholders. So we've got um, forestry companies, um, big farm corporations, companies, um, individual farm, you know, farno, farm hold, um, land hold, holders. Um, so we, you know, it's a it's an education exercise. Um, and you know, what we've done with with this film is um, is a step towards um, getting people to. Um, highlight the the issue that we have here, and so I live on the live at, at the mouth of our river, and so every time it, every time we get heavy rain events, more because the the riverbed is rising, the as soon as it starts pouring down, the river just goes wide straight away and starts eating into the banks on both sides of the river because there's no more deep channels to um, handle heavy heavy flows, and so. You know, sustainability is the is, is the is the catch catchphrase these days. And um, when we're losing rain every time it every time it when we're losing land every time it pours, you know, that's that's hardly sustainable. And so, yeah, our 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 culture here back here was built built along these river flats. And so, you know, with them vanishing with every storm, it's you know it's not good. So. We're putting a stake in the ground and um, doing something about it. Mm. Mm. it. Yeah, I have so many images in my mind and experience of um, the landscape, and especially, you know, seeing how the rivers in New Zealand and they swell and trees just literally kind of passing through into the the ocean. It's 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 quite something you know quite phenomenal and I visited early 2000 and then went back in you know 20 2015 and the you know the difference in the shape and scale of the landscape um you know it is incredibly 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 disheartening especially when 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 you know that New Zealand is so connected into the relationship with the land and how critical it is um to you know you know to society and to people as well um it'd be good to kind of understand also the political context of the area i think graham you 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 suggested that you have many stakeholders and relationships and how are they how are those kind of are are they sticking to the agreement and do you think you'll have challenges in the future to to hold um these corporations to to the 100 year plan yeah i think um you know i'm i prefer um the carrot as opposed to the stick so um both local and central government have um roles to play in this um a lot of this um was caused by past government policy about you know, where people were given land blocks and then um, were penalised if they still had trees standing on them. And so, the government has come to the come to the party by funding, um, trying to plant plant the, the worst eroding classes of land. Um, but there's just you know real slow uptake by by the by by the landowners. And so, um, I just pin my hopes on education. Um, whether it's whether it's the present generations or future generations, and um, because because the situation has been going for so long, it'll be 
it'll be hundreds of years down the path, um, down the track before we see, you know, any gains. And so mm. um, most of the, the erosion, the sediment loads are coming from either farmland or former farmland or from commercial forests mm. that's at present. But a lot of my work is in the, the Rokumara Ranges. So that's one of our larger, our, our country's larger piece blocks of um, native forest. And so it's it's starting to contribute um, increasing amounts of sediment as well. And that's that's because the protection values of that forest, because it, again, it's, it's it grows over um, fragile geology and they, their protection values have been compromised by introduced animals. So mm. deer and possums um, specifically. So it's such a rugged place, rare, you know, really dangerous that um, no one goes in there, especially to hunt. And so the mm. animals have left, been left to their devices really. So it's sad because mm. I've worked in there for 30 years and um, from being, you know, a so-called garden of Eden to the situation where we fight find today we um we just don't see birds anymore and so mm. for a forest having no birds that's catastrophic and so um increasing sediment loads so mm. in the higher parts of that oak to get up to four meters of rainfall per annum and so you know that that's that's pretty phenomenal amount of rainfall but um in the past when the the, the, the forest was functioning 30 percent of that the rainfall would be intercepted by the canopy a further 30 percent would be um dissipated down the trunk and then what used to hit the forest forest floor there used to be a huge mossy carpet so you could walk along in there and sink up to your knees it covered everything even down on the steep slopes and so the water that hit the forest floor would just this giant sponge would just soak it up and just slow release it through the year and so um and that would also recharge um, the aquifers. So for, for us, where we live down in the lowlands and um, coastal, um, we need to be getting, we need to be getting that, that Okumara functioning again. And so that's probably the pressing issue. And then, you know, getting the biodiversity values back. So mm -hmm. huge, huge issues confronting our, our community here. So, but you know, we, we we can't be we can't be doing nothing because you know it's so the the, the geology around here is so fragile will be will be will be smothered. Mm. Thank you, Graham. I could talk to you about the politics in New Zealand for a very long time, um, and just you know left when it was still a conservative government, and and you know how now kind of hoping that you have hope. I feel you know very much a not having hope living here in the UK currently. Um, to, going to Natalie and Alex um, to talk about the film and how you collaborated together. It'd be really interesting to hear from you briefly about how you recorded the footage um, and, and how, you, how you collaborate as artists as well. Uh, yes, yeah, so just to start with that, the, the concept of the film was really interested in our customary chants, motetea, and how they uh, follow an orator at different points of a landscape and often beginning up in the mountains and, and taking us down a location down the river to the sea. And so this whole of system landscape was a really important part of the concept as well as the, uh, that would inform the structure of the film. And there's a mention of, uh, apart from a motetea at the very end of the, of the video, uh, in terms of how we collaborated, I think uh, we, Alex has worked on some really big video projects and has worked with other crew who have got uh, just the kind of access to technology that would allow us to really fulfill Graham's vision. So Alex, I'll pass that to you. Yeah, um, so the one of the things, um, I guess, Natalie, it's important for you to maybe talk a little bit about the visual motetea before I talk about the camera and tech I might just pass it back just so that, so that it goes one two like that um about how we brought technology and storytelling under that structure so just so with it with the more the form the orator uh or the orators will take the form of a bird a flying bird and so that bird is flying through narrating 
the important features of the landscape. And so that begins with, uh, as mentioned in the some of the uh, the script about a relationship that begins with our atua, our deities, Papa Tuna through our Earth Mother, Ranganui, our Sky Father, and so that that is up up there. But the third element, of course, is Wainui Atea, the ocean, and therefore the whole of system water cycle. And mm -hmm. so that water cycle is a really important part of what we wanted to bring through and this understanding that what's happening out at the ocean and the evaporation of water comes back to the mountains and comes back downstream and that uh, relationship with the with the earth so that it's yeah really thinking of from a Maori point of view of a whole of system whole of landscape view yeah so with that with the sort of structure guiding us um natalie did a lot of work thinking about how motetia might flow through the film and then the other kind of job was how to bring visuals in in the right way um to support that evolving kind of analysis. And I think we we went up with Graham into the upper catchment. And so we had to kind of learn to pay visual attention to what was happening in particular with Parafenoa Mea and the expressions of sediment. Mm -hmm. And so we had we, we really wanted to make quite, I guess, slow and thoughtful decisions about how to respond to um, something as complex, sometimes as subtle as Parafenoa Mea, like the fine sediment. And then on those bigger deluges, the big fast pushes out of that sediment where it really is moving land and over a period of days. Um, once you start thinking about um, the nature of water and how it, in a sudden deluge, parafenoa and uh, rock kind of gets pushed and moved. So we knew we had to pay attention in a way to certain visual expressions. And so we went up into the, the top of the catchment, um, first of all in vehicles to take the cameras kind of part way. Um, onto the bed and then after that we went on foot into the smaller finer parts of that valley and one of the most I guess harrowing parts for me as Toiwi as someone as an outsider but with a, a, a sort of a beginning understanding about um, the whakapapa relationship that was being damaged um, or, or being changed by settler colonial land management was to do with the fact that the hill itself had entirely collapsed and we are now standing in a land interior that's a man-made intervention mm. and the sacred nature of being in that land interior and so um one of the things with the drone footage was that that was a very um it felt a very tentative space to enter and it had to be held in a way by um, a lot of care and there's no way a drone should ever have been able to be in that in terms of like the wellness and the health of that of that bush and the wider ecosystem so it's a, it's a it's something we're trying to bring a lot of care to and the other thing was um observation so we, t we take quite small cameras with us so that we can walk around and by dint of being up there um those rocks there's a rock that graham holds and just sort of it opens in his hands and that that um, type of um, that type of really really young rock that just breaks apart it hasn't had lots and lots of pressure or in terms of geological larger time frames that that was something we actually encountered um, just by dint of being in the valleys and working quite slowly and but we thought it was a very powerful sort of poetic or a real way to see what Graham's actually saying which is that this kind of young land it was never suitable to have all of the um, clear felling and stripping back of that bush layer that actually held it all together being so young and fragile but we needed for people that that maybe aren't farmers or that aren't um, geologists to be able to see and understand it and so just paying attention to um, the demeanor of, of different rock forms you have the solid rocks that impede the water flow and you have the sort of softer rocks that break apart under the forces of sun and and so i think um and i guess another film or another way of approaching the film is just to be uh, to go back over time and so when uh, you'll see in the film that confluence of the highly loaded water meeting the clearer water from upstream and then in that moment you can just see with your eyes the impact of one gully system but yep. then what Graham and Natalie are referring to is that the scientists and others have counted the the slips exceeding over what you know around that thousand mark and you just have to kind of add that four meters that Graham was talking about and so it's a very big scale mm. yeah we we have come to time but i feel like we actually haven't um addressed the really critical um question when you're talking about care so maybe we could just hold 
a couple more minutes together, if that's okay with um, our, our hosts, Invisible Dust, to, to, in talk about, to talk about the importance of Indigenous wisdom um, and its importance to conservation and addressing the impacts of climate change. I think if we can really just hold this space for a couple of minutes, it would be great to hear your thoughts from all three of you. Graham, would you like to start with that being our tangata whenua, iti whenua? You're on mute. <laughs> Thanks, Kazi. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. I'd just like to um, say that um, I pin my hopes on education, you know, and so. Um, bringing up our, our, the generations under us, you know, to normalize, you know, restoration mahi. And so um, whatever I do work-wise, you know, involve the kids, you know, so um, as far as our, our indigenous knowledge, Mataranga Māori, um, I just think that, um, you know, the world's ready the world is ready for a different way of looking at things. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it's getting that respect back at the, the sacredness of what's around us. And so with our, with our Māori um, beliefs, um, we are the younger ones of all the plants, all the animals on this planet, and that um, it, there's a responsibility for us to care for them. And so, you know, I just think it's not that much to ask. And so, yeah, I'd just like to thank all the organisers again for um, giving us this opportunity. So, yep, kia ora. Kia ora. thank you, Graham. Uh, Alex and Natalie, yeah. Indigenous wisdom, I think, has been uh, sidelined, colonised, uh, erased through so many different mechanisms that uh, it's... Uh, those who have been the, the keepers of that knowledge, those who are still able to maintain that knowledge, it's been un, under threat for so, so long. And so now is the time to uh, put aside the settler colonial capitalist models that have been centre for the last uh, 200 years and put that aside and stop and listen and think, why are we in the state we're in now? And I think it's urgent, I think it's necessary and I'm not sure that uh, it's easy to dismantle that uh, centering of settler colonialism, but it's vital that we do. So in terms of the relationship with land, it's in all of our stories that this was a, sea, a former seafloor that's been pushed up out of the ocean. That is our Maui, that is our, it's listening to those stories. And actually there is absolute, deep understanding there of that geology mm. and to stop uh, minimizing the importance of those stories, to stop the uh, paternalistic uh, viewing of them as merely myths, but actually see them as really deep knowings that come from people who spend a long time in one place. And so for us, it begins with listening to, uh, to Graham and people like Graham who really are understanding place and looking at how do we contribute to hope for that next generation and I think hope is vital and our, those that hope has been laid down by our ancestors who traversed the blue oceans and uh, in their waka their technologies of ocean growing canoes and we can hold on to that where they will look at the stars and look at the relationship with the stars in the ocean if we can take that model of uh, knowledge, then we could listen more deeply. Kia ora. Kia ora. And um, just to support there too, by saying that I think it's really important for um, the settler colonial Tauiwi and um, to support farmers to um, re to be open to these narratives about how, how they have practice, but also support farmers that want to move. And um, so there's the is that sort of, um, we, yeah, I really think it's important in terms of narrative to um, help people 
see what they thought that they saw in a, in a in maybe a different way and try and work on openness to uh, the indigenous land management that never stopped that was maintained all the way through the second colonial layer interrupted it um, and one thing I would say too um, is to acknowledge invisible dusts um, sort of discussion that it started two years ago in the um, in the previous kind of incarnation of this conference and I think it's probably one really striking thing it's important that um, when the world is looking to indigenous knowledge is that they have participants on on you know within things on panels um, bringing the knowledge rather than sort of looking at knowledge to, to sort of take and absorb and adapt I think it's very very important that um, th that the uh, Pacific Wananui um, peoples are in the in the kind of lead places because they maintained those positions throughout in a steadfast way and so um, I think those kinds of um, being open to um, standing back from the authority and letting proper partnership and proper indigenous leadership um, kind of be the guide is really, really important. And that's one of the things we're trying to work on in, a, in some way in the film as well. It's just patiently working through some of those issues. Mm. Kia ora. Thank you, Natalie, Alex and Graham. Um, I think I have to bring the, the talk to an end. Um, it feels like we haven't had enough time to kind of unpack everything and you know in the deep thoughtful way that it actually really needs the time um to offer and um agree with one of the comments in the chat you know it's really important that this work gets seen by by many people including those who are kind of making the decisions as well so thank you everyone thank you to the audience for staying with us for 10 minutes longer and um have a nice evening and enjoy your day in Aotearoa and um, see you soon. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who's turned up and shown up to be here with us today from all across the, uh, the world. And I can see messages coming in from our beautiful friends from around the world. Thank you. Kia ora. Send my aloha to my, see my sisters from other, other mothers coming through the chat. Kia ora. Thank mm -hmm. you.